Uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm Joel here with my dad. Rick. And I'm Rick. So glad to be here with you today. So dad, uh, today we I want to address something that we got a special request from one of our faithful listeners. We love special requests. We have three faithful listeners. And we love faithful <laughs> listeners too. <laughs> all, two, all three of them. Yeah, that's right. Not a couple of them anyway. And uh, she wrote in and she said, I want to hear about spiritual gifts. I talk about spiritual gifts because it's something that's confusing. And I started thinking... Part of the reason it's confusing is because there's two, yay, three different mentions of what could be called spiritual gifts. And I've heard there's as many as 60 spiritual gifts. Oh, Some yeah. say there's only a few spiritual gifts. So I thought this this is probably, based on our little pre-conversation, going to end up turning into two, two podcasts because yeah. of the length of it. So I want to first address what I guess would be called... Are they called the motivational gifts, the ones in Romans? Yeah, they've kind of come to be called that. Okay. I mean, there's no, I mean, there is a biblical reason for it, but it goes back to the Greek and it's all complicated. So, without explaining that, yeah, the motivational gifts. Motivational meaning like your motivation, what are your drives? So, right. Like, what's kind of what drives why you do what you do in terms of your interaction with truth? Is that how yeah. you define it? Yeah, it could almost be kind of considered personality because you're going to have one of these that is dominant and it's going to be with you probably from birth. Yeah. And um, and it's not going to change. That will always be dominant. The goal is to develop all of them, but there will be one that will be kind of dominant. And so, yeah, they're, they're kind of motivations. So uh, I guess we don't have to read the whole passage, but let's go with, I guess there's. But OK, but before we jump into that, so this would probably be our next podcast. There's another set of them. In, is it First Corinthians? In First Corinthians, there's two actually this two lists of gifts in first corinthians but one's the one that's the most controversial right so we'll leave the controversial one for next podcast yeah that's <laughs> leave everybody, kind of a little teaser there leave you know? everybody hanging uh, but for this one i think this is really powerful because when you start to understand these gifts that are in romans it for me helped me understand a lot of the way i see the world yeah and it is kind of like a personality but mm -hmm. what i found is it's oh okay that's why i see everything in a particular way and my drive is to you know, present truth or hear truth in a certain way. So uh, let go, let's go with the one in Romans, kind of unpack yeah. it for us. What What's your take on that? Yeah, the other real strength of this is it, it helps you. I think the biggest thing is it helps you understand other people. I mean, obviously, it's always cool to understand me. Oh, this is why I'm this way. But the biggest thing is it can help you. It can help keep peace in the body of Christ because you understand other people and you realize, okay, they are different than me, but it's a, it's a God-implanted thing. So let me just list those gifts. It's in Romans 12, verses 3 through uh, 8. And um, there are seven of them. Okay. And uh, I'll just list them real quickly. And then what we could do is, now there's all kinds of uh, drives associated with each of these. But First of all, these these seven gifts, it, I like to put it this way. It's like if you were put on a pair of yellow sunglasses, everything you see would be tinted yellow. If you put on a pair of green, everything's tinted green. Well, these seven gifts are like seven different colored sunglasses that you're going to see the world through. And one of them will be primary. But yeah. again, the goal is to develop all of these in your life because Jesus demonstrated all of these. So when you see these characteristics, you'll say, oh, that one's kind of me. But this is what I'm weak in. Well, that's an area you need to work on to develop because you want to be like Jesus. And he demonstrated all of these. All right. Now, I've got a question on that, but let's go, keep moving yet, in this direction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So here are the seven gifts. I already have an issue. No. <laughs> the seven gifts are prophecy. And that's not like telling the future or anything like that. Okay. It's, it's, this, it's a way you view the world. Prophecy, serving uh, or ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, organizing, and mercy and in different translations different words are used so we're just going to stick with those like organizing may be called ruling in one version but ruling kind of has a connotation of being an authority and walking around with a stick beating people or something you know so we're not talking about that kind of ruling right right it's basically an organization thing so each of those have two primary motivating uh characteristics things that are views ways that you view the world you want to go with your question now, or you want to go? No. Over so each, each you're saying each of the seven have two primary views. Two primary right, ones. So let's, yeah. Like let's go with the first one you mentioned was prophecy. Yeah. Let, let's go with prophecy. And so the person who has this motivational gift of prophecy, or who sees the world through the prophetic viewpoint, um, their their drives the thing that motivates them is to proclaim truth and to expose sin. Mm. This is the kind of person that sees things as black and white, and and when they see something wrong, 
they're going to say something. They, right. they just they're not going to keep quiet. They they speak up, and I've been accused of being a little prophetic. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That definitely a prophetic. Was and in my earlier days, a little pathetic. Pathetic too. prophetic. Yes, <laughs> that oftentimes. Yeah, pathetic that, prophetic. As we say, the church needs prophets, but not too many of them. Okay. Well, yeah. Everybody's yeah. So so pro- that's prophet, the prophecy is. It, Everything's black and white. Like, that's wrong. That's right. And yeah. so these are the people that are going to say it. And I'm guessing these are the people that in a more immature state are going to say it without even considering other points of view. Right. Or possibilities that maybe you don't have all of the answers. And there we see a biblical example of each of these two. And Peter's a biblical yeah, example of prophecy. Classic. He was always the one to speak up. You know, now, Jesus... Let's do this over in the tr- yeah. transfiguration. We need to build some houses. And right. Jesus yeah. is like, what are you talking hey, about, man? Jesus. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm going to die. No, Jesus, don't talk yep. that way, you know? That's right. I mean, yeah. he just had to, that's wrong, you know, expose things. And he just, so the prophet is going to be very vocal. Right, right. And again, it's not foretelling the future. This is a way of viewing the world. Yeah. And so you're always seeing things as black or white, right or wrong, and you have a hard time keeping your mouth shut when you see something that you feel is wrong. Yeah. So and and, and there's probably not a lot of nuance, like good, bad. Right. And it's like, well, <laughs> there's a little bit of both in there, but you're just yeah. And then those are immature characteristics. And you see Peter later when you see him reading when you read first and second Peter, you see here's a man who's matured in that gift mm-hmm. of prophecy. And so he's much more mellow, much more loving, much more kind, and much more understanding than when he was a young man. Yeah. And so we all want to develop, and all of these have carnal applications. Carnal meaning, like meaning, yeah, driven less un- by spirit-led living and more like that. your natural right. kind the, of Right, the flesh, the yeah, carnate. The You're flesh, more yeah. driven by your own nature. And so God, you want to develop yeah. a maturity in these. Immature versus maturity, I guess it'd be a, yeah. a more normally used word. So. I, I would hope that I'm a little less pathetic i mean prophetic as i'm older now yes i can i can vouch for the fact that you are and anybody who but thinks ch- you're not didn't know you when you were younger <laughs> <laughs> but here's the challenge though sometimes i tell people this i'm like i feel like half the man i used to be because the things are a lot more gray now yeah and my natural thing would be it was just so easy when it was all black and white oh, yeah and i mean i can still pretty much call a spade a spade but sometimes i'm like okay that's a spade but maybe there's something i don't see right and I, maybe that's hopefully that's the well that's of, what you know the law is always easier to live by than grace yeah because you can't live up to it but at least you know when you're screwing up yeah, that's you know right. that's the thing i love the law because I, at least i know what i'm doing wrong when you're trying to walk in the spirit you go well i kind of think this is right but right. um maybe i don't you know so it's and and so i mean a, prof, a prophet would be very important for someone first coming into the faith who literally has no understanding of right wrong right uh, i mean a prophetic voice would be like hey get on the straight and narrow um which some people really need particularly that. somebody who's not had a lot of discipline in their life or structure yeah prophets are good with structure that's a gift a gift of, of mm-hmm. that's the gift of it obviously prophets can be annoying too yeah um but that would be the gift of it is there are some people that just need very clear well, delineation if we didn't have them too we'd be we'd be just always drifting into oh well you know that that's probably not right i mean the bible kind of says that but you know it's okay and <laughs> let's just pour mercy on that's the, it. so yeah, we same, need that's the, the mercy latter one yeah that's yeah. the last one yeah so the second one was serving second one minist- is serving ministering, you call it or something like that? serving ministry serving <laughs> um and the drive of this person is to meet physical needs and the reason they do that is they it's a spiritual drive mm-hmm. because they realize if I can meet this physical need, if I can if I can vacuum the church on Saturday, then the pastor doesn't have to, so he can be home studying and preparing more. Yeah. And so their drive is to meet physical needs. And they're ones that oftentimes are considered like less spiritual in the church. Yeah. Okay, and it's funny because let's give this situation. You know, we're going to have a prayer meeting on Thursday. Well, Bob's never at the prayer meetings. Bob's just not spiritual, you he's, know? He's at the soup kitchen feeding people. Exactly. <laughs> and so he's out there and he looks around and he says, right. well, I'm the only one from the church that even comes out here to care about this. Or I'm the only one doing this, you know? They're all, all they do is pray. They don't really do anything to help, you Oof. know? And so it's easy for us to be judgmental of one another, not realizing his, that's his gift. That's his drive. That's what that's what he sees as that's what God has put in him to meet physical needs. Yeah, which which so I'm I'm thinking here a little bit. Some of the complaint that I hear from people, of the, quote, the, uh, you know, the, there's kind of the social justice bent side of the yeah. church where where there are people that are like, forget about doctrine, forget about it, just love everybody and just be the hands and feet of Jesus. So I mean, we have a need for that, right? Like you could get to the other 
extreme oh, of yeah. it where you you've totally that's the point of this yeah every single one of these has a purpose but it needs to be mature and it needs to be in balance you see jesus he called out sin when it was time to call out sin right you know you brood of vipers you snakes and then this woman comes caught in adultery and just says hey you know what yeah she had it coming yeah go go your way sin no more you really think she went and sinned no more well no of course she did but it's like he just pours this mercy out in he her. knew what was needed in the right measure at the right time exactly yeah that's that's a huge part of it is is learning what to becoming all things to all people at the right time being yeah that sensitive to the spirit and developing yeah. that characteristic too S- serving people that is an interesting one because i have heard a lot of people complain about uh certain people like that like oh, yeah. it's just like they're you know all they're worried about is you know they don't have they're not spiritually minded they just want to meet all these physical needs but the, the need that really needs to be met is the spiritual need yeah well, yeah but sometimes people can't get the spiritual need met until their physical needs are met yeah so, so we need yeah. both we had this pastor on staff who you'd hardly ever see him in the church because i mean well we got to be out sweeping the parking lot you know because people are going to be walking in they might trip over that little branch or right. change the oil in the bus because uh, they're going to be driving home and that bu- the oil is dirty you know and He's just, he was always serving, you know. Yeah. And he could appear to be very unspiritual. Yeah. But he saw it as meeting a spiritual that need. That is his act of spiritual worship. Exactly. Serving. Well, yeah. Which is interesting, too. I mean, that brings up the point that all of these, when you're really walking in the gifting that God gave you, you are doing a spiritual act of worship. And the body of Christ needs that, which exactly. is why Paul kept saying, like, hey, you know, if everybody's like an arm or an eye, or like, where would the body be? We need all of these parts. Yeah. And then you can't judge another part when it's walking out its part yeah the hand is out there doing its work you know while the yeah. mouth is praying right so they all have their p- purpose and they all have and we need all of them and, i mean in, in that the context that paul says we don't judge based on that because everybody's walking out i mean am i am i mixing two verses well, i'm not sure but it sounds like a good mix I, I think it works can't get in too Let's much go trouble with it, with it. <laughs> yeah and all of the next one they're which in is the, the same teachers. book is the teachers yes. in there yes the teachers are freaking out right <laughs> the now the teachers are like no no that's wrong because <laughs> you mix two verses <laughs> that's the deal with teaching the t- the drives of teachers are the, they the third one they are the third How one convenient. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we've gone, gone into Great heresy for the segue third one. there you know <laughs> um so the teachers their two mo- main drives are one to clarify truth and then secondly, to validate information. And so these are the guys that when you hear them speaking, they're, they're saying, now the Greek word for that, you know, the Hebrew word for that. And they're, they're always trying to uh, very literal on what the scripture says, you know, and we've got to uh, stick with what the scripture says, which um, many times people think I'm a teacher, mm-hmm. but I'm not. You'll see I'm the next one. You, you personally. Me personally. The way you communicate. Yeah, the way yeah. I communicate. Yeah, yeah. It says, oh, you're such a great teacher. Well, by motivation, by drive, I'm really not a teacher. Yeah, because of exactly what we just did just now. Yeah. We kind of like, yeah, I'm like, work. Ah, it's okay. <laughs> you know, as long as it's kind of within the context of the general scripture, then, eh, you know, it's good enough. It's Whereas close a enough, teacher you know? would be like, no, that is not yeah. the context Give of that word. Give me chapter and verse yeah. on that, you know, and I go, well, I don't really know, but... And, it, it's in there somewhere. I thank God for teachers. For, I think of one, we've mentioned him almost every podcast, it seems like. Keith Lamb, like yeah. the ultimate teacher. Oh, yeah. Like he knows what the word means. And when I'm when I'm trying to figure out the real, like some real guidance in my life, sometimes I'll call him and I'll be like, what does this verse mean? Yeah. And man, he'll unpack how it connects to the Genesis Abrahamic to, covenant. Yeah. And you're like, huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. But it's so helpful. Yeah. Um, I can't live in that space personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, but man, there's, they're a gift to the body for sure. Yeah, it is. And it's funny because we'll tie that in with the next one, exhortation, because um, I would often, Keith would sometimes have me speak there at the church. And um, by exhortation, my, when my message is, my goal is to make it practical, to help you grow spiritually. I remember Keith saying to me one time, he says, man, I just love it when you teach because you always make it so practical. He says, I never even think to give the practical application. <laughs> like, I just, I put the truth out there and the figure they'll know what to do with it. stand on its own, right? <laughs> yeah. yes. They'll know what to and do And we're all it. looking at the truth like a, you know, a cow with a new, what's it, a steak, a cow with a new gate? Calf at a new gate yeah. or something, you know, <laughs> deer in the headlights. Oh. It's like, what is that? You know, like, what do, I, I remember uh, we had another guy who was a teacher at our church and he was teaching the young marrieds one time and it was just this really profound thing. One of the young moms came up to me and says, you know, man, that was really profound, but what's that got to do with me having to get up in the morning and fix cornflakes for my kids? You know, (laughs) what do I do with this truth, you know? And so that's a teacher, you know I mean? I'm just plopping the truth up there. I'm just got to validate the truth. Let's make sure we got the Greek and the Hebrew behind it. And we got five passages to back it up, you know? You see, and you you can spot those ones that are very into the, um, yeah, 
the the word thing. And I, what I've noticed too is, um, I think a lot of people I've seen this a lot with young young speakers. Um, they admire a certain teacher, mm-hmm. but maybe their gifting isn't teaching. And when they try to teach, they make it really clunky. So yeah. they'll say yeah. things like, like we, you used the example one time, like, yeah. now this Greek word for sword was literally a piece of metal with two sharpened sides. Yeah. And you're like, well, duh, and that's what it's was. You know? <laughs> Why did you tell us that? Well, it's it's the desire to... You know, but it's clunky when, like, a teacher will tell you, "Here's why that really matters," yeah. right? But uh, it gets clunky when somebody yeah, has because just, it was a short sword. It was for hand to hand combat, and we're in hand to hand combat with a devil. It's yeah. not the big long sword that was for which that yeah. actually may be more exhortational on your thing. Well, that would yeah. be yeah. See, I can't get away from it because that's my drive. That's right. That's You're like, me. so what? So okay, so we've gone prophecy, serving, teaching, and now let's now jump to your gift, which is exhortation. And exhortation that's with two mine primary too, a little drives. Bit. I think that's another. Well, you, yeah, you've definitely developed that one and that's the point again you don't just say well this is mine and so therefore that's who i am and you know that's how god made me and i'm never going to change no you develop all of these because all of these reflect a a facet of the lord jesus yeah well and i grew up seeing the impact of your application-based teaching Mm -hmm. in people's lives and i go man i i like i can sit up and scream truth all day but people most people are trying to do the best they can yeah um, I mean, that's something I learned from you. Sometimes I have a hard time believing that, but it's like most people are trying to do the best they can. But like, I still believe in the depravity of man. By the way, though, don't get me in trouble here with all the teachers. Well, after the tithing, we after the tithing uh, uh, podcast, you're well, done. Anyway, <laughs> the next kidding. one's the one that's going to really get oh, us in man, trouble. Yeah. I'm going to lose more friends over that one. Than so, any. exhortation is what's your drive? Mine is exhortation, and the two major drives of an exhorter are to stimulate faith mm. and to promote spiritual growth. So that's where like, okay, if you can tell me what that sword is, that's awesome. But how does that cause me to be more like Jesus? How does that cause me to walk right, in greater right, faith right. or become more like the Lord? And so that's where my drive is always make it very, very practical. And uh, for example, I remember one time I was teach I was teaching and um, there was this thing I just wanted to, I was trying to wrap it up and just saying, look, God has these, this thing has it for you, this blessing for you. You just got to lay hold of it though. Cause you can just like Bartimaeus, you can, if he hadn't cried out to the Lord, Jesus would have just passed on by, but he says, son of David, have mercy on me. And I just wanted to kind of get everybody to grab hold of the promise of God. And the only illustration I could think of was back in the old Testament where the children of Israel prayed for meat, you know, in rebellion. Mm-hmm. And God says, I'll give you quail till it comes out your nostrils, you know. And and so they had to reach up and grab the quail. And so I said, it's just like the quail in the Old Testament. You just, it, that blessing of God, you just have to reach up and grab it. And I thought, Which man, is, every teacher out here is freaking out. Because it was know? actually a curse. It was God. a curse, yeah. <laughs> and I knew, I knew it. two people in the church were going to come up to me afterwards. Yeah, and they, sure enough, as soon as I did, they come up like, hold on, hold on. I know that was actually a curse, but it was just an illustration. I just wanted people to be able to see it and lay hold of it and grab the promise of God, you know. And so that's kind of the difference between the exhortation. I kind of knew that wasn't really 100% right, but it it, if it helps people to grow spiritually, a visual, it's yeah. a visual that helps them latch hold and maybe take action to grow spiritually and trust God. That's my major drive. And that's the drive of an exhorter is to encourage and exhort and cause people to uh, trust God for bigger and better things. Good. That's the good next one. thing giving is giving. Now, a giver, this is interesting, and this is, illustrates again we're not to just say, well, that's not, exhortation's not my gift. Well, teaching's not my gift, you know, so I, it doesn't matter how I handle the word. You know, well, prophecy's not my gift, so I can just be wishy-washy on sin. All these need to develop our life, and giving's a perfect example. Well, I'm not a giver, so therefore I don't give, you know. A giver, their two primary drives are to entrust their assets, not to just give them away, mm. but entrust them to ministries and people to entrust them to be used in the kingdom of God and then to maximize the results of those investments. So a giver, they're going to be looking for where can this these funds, because they see it as a, as a, a divine uh, stewardship, that this, these are God's funds, I've got to use them and get maximum effectiveness out of them. I can't just throw them over here and throw them over there. They want to entrust them to a ministry or to a person that is going to use them in the most effective way. Yeah. And th- these are the guys that can be a little frustrating because they're the ones yeah. that want to see the bank statements yeah. of the church, right? And it can sound like they also want to be like personally they're... involved. So it's not like, well, I'll just give this to you and whatever you do with it, you just go your way and I trust you. Th- so they can sometimes give with strings attached. 
attached. Mm. And they used to drive me now, crazy. Is strings too. attached to the carnal side, or is that a blessing side of it? I well, mean, like it can a, be either, depending on their motivation. Because I say sometimes accountability is a good thing. The accountability yeah. is a good thing, and if their heart is right, yeah. but if it's like, well, I just want to make sure this is done, you know, the way I want it done. Controlling, controlling, yeah. yeah. So it it depends on their heart, and you never know. And these are the guys that used to frustrate me, like in raising support for a project or something, because what they try to do is they want others to enjoy this same benefit and value that they get from giving. So they're the guys that go, you need $10,000? I tell you what, I'll give you five if you can raise the other five. Right. And I always just go... <laughs> You know, if you want to give the five, give it. If you don't, keep it. That's I don't like those care. matching matching gift people those on, matching on uh, the radio where they're like, somebody said yeah. they'll give a matching gift for the next hour if you're like, yeah. what are you, are you being cheap? Like, what's the deal? Yeah, I just kind of want to go, look, if you want to give it, give it. If you don't, don't. But don't put this pressure on me. But their drive it's is just, a godly drive. It's just like an exhorter saying, I want people to live out the thing. The yeah. way they do it is through, I want people to live out their faith through giving. Yes. That makes sense. I yeah. want them to experience the same joy, the blessing of seeing their funds be used and this is a good ministry so I'll put five if they'll raise the other five but the person receiving will be like you're just putting this pressure on me yeah. keep your stinking you're money stressing you me don't out, want to give yeah. it you know <laughs> so, especially with my motivation it's like I'd rather not have the money than have the pressure you know so just yeah. keep it whatever but, but givers man I mean Thank God for givers because oh, yeah. a lot of the work of the church is done by people. And givers, I mean, I've seen this. They tend to make a lot of money. And it's just maybe a function of them having been so generous. Yeah. They make a lot of money, so they have a lot to give. Well, that is one of the other motivation or gifts. They do have an ability to see where money can be made. They do see things that others might look. I have a friend of mine. He's a classical giver. And uh, he'd be driving down the road, and we'd see a pile of junk alongside the road, and he'd go, I know, I can turn, get $200 for that. And he'd stop and throw it in the back of his truck. You know, <laughs> it just Really? He could just... He just knew how to make money, yeah, and um, he he just could out of nothing. He, Thank so, God for givers. Yeah, they they drive everything else really. Yeah. You know? Each of these gifts kind of has a balancing uh, side to it, but giver doesn't. It's kind of the one in the middle that drives everything, that makes everything possible. You know, because because yeah. the money gospel's makes the world free. Go around. <laughs> no, but the gospel's free, but the pipeline to get it out there is expensive. That's true. You know, so it, true. it costs money to send missionaries and to open churches and do those things. So yeah, the funding. Of so it. they enable it all to happen, and 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 a mature giver is doing it as unto the Lord as a spiritual gift, and and so. Um, it, it, it is a spiritual thing, and but they can be easily misunderstood because money is typically seen as filthy lucre. You yeah. Know? But, um, well, Jesus talked a whole bunch about money. Yeah, but he talked about how to use it right. And so yeah. a mature giver is using it right. The next one is the organizing, and that's uh, they have two, motiva- uh, two primary drives. Now, I've heard that one called leadership too, which is kind of irritating to me because I'm like, you can be a yeah. leader and have all of those. Yeah, it, that's what I, that's why I like the term organization yeah, yeah. because I think actually one translation calls it ruler, but again, with a ruler, we sort of think of the guy who's standing up at the top and calling it and out. You know, and, yeah. yeah, and the thing is, you may be a peon, you may be just a, a average person in the church, you may have no position with any of these, but this is the way you're going to see the world. Yeah, And so the organizer, their drives are to plan ahead and to complete tasks, to see things completed. So they're always going to be looking at, um, well, what are the steps? You know, how do we do this here? Planning ahead. And they'll be frustrated if they go to a church that's, you know, all lovey-dovey, but just kind of seems like, you know, I used to tell people, if you don't like organized religion, you'll love our church because we're not organized. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's not true. But but the point is, they're going to be driven crazy in a church where it just seems like everything sort of fly by the seat of the pants. Yeah. Because they want to plan ahead. They want to um, make sure that the projects that. are done. Yeah, I have yeah. some of that. Yeah. Yeah, and and so that organization, you want to have all these again. Yeah. That's as you're as you're maturing, you're seeing each of these come out in your life. Hopefully. So yeah. the the organizer, they're the great they're they're great. Boy, they're the ones that if something happens, they'll go, Well, here, Bob, you go take care of this, and Sue, you go take care of that, and John, you take care of this, and we're gonna get this all done, you know. And what's the negative side of that one? Um, well, the negative side I would be I it can know, be very controlling. I was wondering if they yeah. could be super controlling, trying to Pushy make sure, and, and and almost maybe like in their nature and their desire to plan, maybe a little more ra- rational than spirit led, right? Where it's right, like God's yeah. like, no, no, you don't understand what's ahead, and they're like, but we need to plan for what's ahead. Yes, and sometimes there's a balance, right? Yeah, sometimes you, you, the Lord's not telling you. 
right. what's ahead. You know? Yeah, and so you, yeah. Yeah. Nehemiah is the biblical example of the organizer, you know, because yeah. when he came to build the wall, the wall, it's like, together. okay, you take care of this, you know, and you take care of that. And, and he got the materials ahead of time. So a- when he came, he had it all planned out. Apart from his strategic leadership, the wall would not have come together, probably. Right. Yeah. 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 Because it had been sitting there for hundreds of years and uh, nothing had been done. So that's a great example. Nehemiah. All right. What's Nehemiah. the last one? And then the last uh, motiva- uh, gift is mercy. And their drive, they're, they're kind of like the emotional or spiritual counterpart of the serving one. Whereas the server wants to move, remove physical needs and meet physical needs, the mercy person wants to meet emotional needs. Got it. So they're very sensitive to the emotions of people. Now that, that's and mom. And to share burdens. Yeah, that's where that's My where mom, mom is that, in. which is interesting. So I'm, I'm prophetic, which is pretty much the polar opposite yeah. personality-wise of a mercy. Those two balance each other. The mercy... And the prophecy balance each other. And uh, then the teaching and the exhortation kind of provide yeah, a balance yeah. to each other. And then... Um, That's why you said that giving is in the middle, because each of these have a balance. Right. Kind of interesting. And serving and organizing work together, because the, or, the server's just out there doing what's... Oh, he, you know, he's not going to necessarily think it all through, but oh, here's a need. Let's go meet this. Oh, here's a need. And so the organizer helps the server... Yeah. Okay. Put it all together. So they all that, balance each other. You know, I think you, I saw you teaching that one time in, in the context of the, that balancing with the... The menorah. Menorah, yeah. yeah. I remember that. Man, that just flashed back in my mind. Yeah, you put like, each of those on the end, and then they all... You see how it's a balance. when all of them are working, you get proper light. When yeah. one of the lamps in the menorah was out, you didn't have enough light. So the mercy thing is... is I remember growing up, I would say these really straightforward, maybe bombastic things. Oh, yeah. And mom would be like, Joel. Don't, Don't say, those, say things. those things. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it may have been so, true, yeah. but it's just not appropriate to say that. Yeah, know? she would get so upset by stuff I would yeah. say, but that's because the mercy, because she's like, you're going to create emotional distress for people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which I'm like, that's my point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mom, for affirming me in that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, you know, she and I used to have these conflicts, too. Well, not a big conflict, but it was like frustrated with each other until we understood this, because the exhorter, the perfect biblical example of the exhorter is James. And it, the classic passage resource, count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into temptation and trials, because the testing of your faith works patience. This is awesome. And when patience is full, you're going to be complete, lacking nothing. This is awesome. You're having difficulties. Count it all joy. Rejoice. And so when you guys were doing, so, you know, when you guys are going through a hard time, you know, she's like, one, oh, let me help them. Let me relieve it. And I'm going, praise God, this is going to build character. Let and them, let going, suck it up. That's right. Don't you love, yes, I love them. This is good. This is the best thing for them because man they're going to be more like jesus if they live through this if they live right (laughs) so that's interesting so So it helps you to when you realize another person's drive and you realize it's a spiritual thing yeah you know like the prophet if you really say well it's just a wimpy person they don't care about righteousness or they're just loving everybody so let me we've got like four or five minutes here and maybe we can't sum it up in this but there's another mentioning of spiritual gifts which would be called the uh the, like the roles that people play in the church. Ephesians 4, the Doma? Uh, Doma gifts. Okay, okay, so in Ephesians 4, there's another mention of spiritual gifts. But these yeah. are kind of like offices within the church. And I think it's interesting because a lot of times in, in a church, you can have a prophet in an office of a pastor. Right. So with, mention those. Uh, we weren't going to. Yeah, it's Ephesians yeah. 4. It talks about when he ascended, he, he gave gifts to the church. He gave gifts to men. And these are gifts of people. Right. And they're really sort of offices in the church. It's a totally different Greek word. Doma is the Greek word than these gifts. I think. I think. Uh, so far, far off the apostle. The, okay, apostle. Prophet. Prophet. Evangelist and pastor, teacher, or pastor and teacher. So there's either four or five. So these would be roles that people play in leadership within the church. And right. what I think is interesting is you can have a prophetic viewpoint yeah or a serving a gift for, so mm-hmm. and yeah so if so i'm just thinking about what causes a lot of people to go that church over there they're so carnal right right where maybe you've got uh in the role of so what yeah for example you've got a church that you you may have somebody who's a has that prophetic motivation who's the pastor yeah and they're gonna be preaching on hell and they're gonna be preaching on sin and they're gonna be exposing sin and they're gonna be 
And then you've got another church across town where the pastor has that motivation gift of mercy. Mm -hmm. And he's like, we just want to love you and come on in here. We just want you come to experience you the love of Jesus. Yeah. I heard about this church that they had a, a on their sign outside. It says, we love hurting people. And somebody said, oh, they must like to warn people ahead of time. We, we love, love hurting, hurting people. people. We love hurting, <laughs> we people. Love hurting <laughs> people. And that's true of most churches, maybe. Yeah. But anyhow, they don't love it. But they do. And so that's how those can balance out. Or if you had an exhorter or a teacher, yeah. uh, a so teaching real church. Quick, you, the Ephesians gifts, what are they again? And we'll just do apostle, it. Apostle, prophet, Ap evangelist. So apostle would be kind of like the overseer type apostle. Or well, apostle means one who was sent out. And so, I mean, it's a sent one. Okay. And so probably a missionary. I mean, boy, you're getting into muddy water here because we don't really know yeah but it's it's uh, more like probably a missionary would be the closest okay. to an apostle to a church planner maybe prophet would be prophet would be uh, again that one who's proclaiming truth and um um, yeah, pro proclaiming truth. And New Testament prophecy, we'll get into that in the next uh, session or whenever we do the one on the yeah. manifestation. So the, but like a prophet could be maybe somebody that's out there. But there is a special gift of evangelism, right? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So and, it gets it gets tricky, though, because I hear a lot of times, he's a prophet to this church. And, uh, well, what are you talking about like by that? Like, yeah. Well, and that's hard to say. It can be defined because each different yeah. stream has their own little definition but, of so it. That's, but I think it's interesting that the one in Ephesians is specifically about kind of leadership roles in the church. But you can have somebody who's a uh, prophetic gift, serving gift, teaching gift, um, exhortational, giving or organization, or mercy. That's how they view the world. Right. You can have your viewpoint in your role, which is what makes all churches so unique. Because exactly. ultimately, churches tend to become the personality of the pastor, really. Right. Yeah. Um, and which is why you have some churches that are very serving-driven, where it's like, you know, you show up for church Sunday, and they're like, oh, no, we're all under the bridge feeding the homeless. And you're like, oh, Nobody's here this Sunday because we all went out to the bridge. Yeah. And you're like, well, what are visitors supposed to do? Well, they need to come out under the bridge. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, a little okay. sign on the door. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's an interesting thing, because I think that's something that confuses people a lot of times. It's like, well, what are these ones in Ephesians? Because that's a prophet, too. But these are specific drives, and so you can have... Uh, yeah. you uh, And a pastor would be the easiest, or a pastor teacher, for example, because we went, as you mentioned, Keith. Yeah. Man, going to that church was like getting a Bible college. It was like going to a Bible college. <laughs> yes, I mean, man, you're getting this training and teaching, and, and just it's like going to a Bible college. Yeah. Because he was the, quote, pastor. Yeah. But his, his motivation, his drive, the way he saw the world was through that teaching gift. So I think kind of to wrap this this up, what, what, what I hear, and this is kind of what I learned from you growing up is, and I'm seeing it as I get older, you start to see the value in the other gifts when you're young. Yeah. You're like, well, my gift's the most important. Yeah. Is that we need all of these roles functioning together. And if you find yourself kind of irritated by someone else's way of seeing things in the board meeting at the church with your other leaders in the church, one of the quickest things you can do is figure out what's their motivating drive um, and and like, and that's probably where you're disagreeing on some things. But here's the right. thing. You need them to balance you out. Yeah, exactly. If we didn't have all of these functioning, and, and when these aren't all functioning, you see things get out of balance. And that's why it's so important that we figure out what our gift is, learn to be balanced ourselves, and recognize and respect that gift in others, but also recognize we've got a natural bent. And when you lean into that natural bent, that natural tendency, that natural drive, you're really, I mean, a blessing to the kingdom of God through that, right? Yeah, exactly. And you're going to be more energized. You're going to be more fulfilled. Yeah. And um, and again, it's like that menorah. You need all seven of those lamps burning brightly to have the proper amount of light. And so no matter what your gift is, uh, first of all, recognize what your gift is. Second of all, recognize to appreciate others. But thirdly, then, don't stay where you are. Mm -hmm. Become more like Jesus by learning your weaknesses and beginning to ask the Lord to help you develop those characteristics and those drives as well. If you liked what you heard, please consider sharing this with a friend. For more information, visit joelmalm.com or rickmalm.com. Thanks for listening.